Athol Thompson, welcome to the Pacey Performance Podcast. Rob, thanks for having me. I've uh, I've listened to so many of these; it's it's quite surreal to be here. It's great to have you on, and thank you for uh, thank you for giving me time. And as always, with people when I do it for people who are not in the UK, thank you for lining up time zones. I know that's um, can be always fun trying to, to trying to match things up. So I really appreciate you uh, you coming on. Yeah, Anyone that doesn't that. know who you are at all, would you mind just giving us a bit of a, an intro to you? What what you're doing now? What you've done previously? And then we'll uh, we'll kick off the kick off the pod. Yeah, sure. Um, I uh, I'm Athol Thompson. I'm a, a podiatrist and research scientist in um, Aspatar, which is in Doha, Qatar. Um, a podiatrist by trade, um, and I, I started out uh, in on the east coast of Australia, up in the tropics in North Queensland, um, studying biomedical science up there, and then down to QUT in Brisbane for uh, podiatry, um, where I was lucky enough to to just you know land into uh, the the exact time that there was a huge build up for the 2000 Olympics. So. Um, such a buzz around in Australia and, and, and really lucky to be in Brisbane and the Gold Coast where a lot of teams were staying and just so fortunate to be around lots of uh, practitioners that were at the peak of their powers. So um, very lucky there. And uh, I met my now wife and moved across to Northern Ireland where she's from, where she was finishing her um, uh, medical training. And uh, again, very lucky, ran into just fabulous people throughout the uh, different uh, Gaelic clubs and and. Ulster Rugby and Ulster University and so forth, and then on to a, a great opportunity at Aspatar here in Doha, Qatar, where um, I've been for uh, almost 10 years. It'll be December this year, would be 10 years, and um, had the opportunity to come and work uh, in the clinic as a podiatrist, but also um, get my PhD completed um, during that time, which is a little bit varied, but basically worked with... Um, uh, with football players on their return to sport um, through some of their rehabilitation, through their uh, football boot choices and, and also playing surface properties. Um, so really, to be honest, my dream job. It's uh, it's part part engineering. We make these mad machines to load shoes onto to measure forces and torque and, and different things and pressure. Um, we do a little bit of kind of uh, learning from the, the ground staff about how playing services are, are built, how they're maintained, uh, about what effect that might have on on uh, the games played on them and the, and the players that play on them. And then a little bit of work in the clinic still with with football players predominantly now as they, as they come through and um, and oftentimes return from uh, from injuries that can be, you know, you know, career threatening. So they quite often end up out at Aspatar when after, you know, for a longer term rehab. Um, so it's been Really, really interesting, and I, I feel very lucky and fortunate again to have uh, to have got here at a time leading up to the World Cup, where you know at any time you could you could run into just some of your heroes, really people that have written textbooks that you would have read going through university would would be sitting at lunch with you, you know, and and always very happy to give you some of their time. So that's me. So good. I mean, just talking about that that kind of broad area from your PhD talking to people who create surfaces for pitches and things like it's, it's super super interesting and I was going to ask you from the start of that to kind of now and I'm not saying there wasn't kind of sponsorship deals 10 years ago because there clearly was but just that interest from that side of things in terms of the safety in terms of boot manufacturers like how has that what's that journey been like um, in terms of some of the some of the footwear manufacturers, and, yeah, and... just I suppose just the interest in that in the whole area around uh, you know injury player safety, I guess from a from a manufacturer perspective and trying to maximize performance. Yeah, yeah. So um, so I guess it probably is important to say I think everyone thinks um, certainly when you're on the medical side of things, we go straight to you know you know injury, um, but there is always a performance element of this and that's often the way that you want to have those conversations with players coaches performance teams as well uh, you know there's, there's a sort of a um, both elements to that to how you know a player interacts with the surface through the shoes that they choose on their feet um, in terms of the the companies um, they surprisingly were you know were really involved um, once we got into a bit of work out here at Aspatar knowing that this was the place where the where the playing surfaces were being developed. Um, you know, multiple uh, footwear companies were, were 
very keen to collaborate and to be involved. And I guess that was mainly because they knew that those playing surfaces would be hard to recreate at their world headquarters or their research centers. It's, you know, it's, it's kind of a, a desert environment. Uh, it was being played in winter, but there's, there's certain things that go in to make that surface that are probably unique to here, even the, whether that be the type of sand or the grass species or the, the way that it's reinforced to, to make sure it's stable, all sorts of different things. So um, I was pleasantly surprised. Now, there is always an element of, you know, getting that, getting that jump in performance, um, but I'm really happy to say some of some of the stuff we've done out here has gone into trying to ensure that shoes can release a little bit easier from the surface. So trying to decrease that rotational traction or that chance of um, foot fixation or the foot becoming stuck on the surface, and then you know like proximal structures rotating above that and and, and getting into real real bother. Um, especially, it has to be said uh, for for the women's side of the game, which is uh, which is coming up later this year, um, I'm really pleased to see that one of the at some of the companies, um, that side of things is starting to become one of the design parameters. You know, it's always been about performance, and rightly so. It's it, it's always been about uh, performance changes games. You know, like it, it, there's these small moments in matches that if you have that traction there and can, you know, do a curved run, a deceleration, a, a, something amazing. Um, that can change, that moment can change a match. Um, and, and so that is a big part of it. Um, you know, how the boot, how boots feel, how they fit, um, uh, the, the you know, interaction they have with the ball for shooting accuracy, all of those things have always been huge parts of football boots. But I think finally seeing for the first time, um, rather than just lip service and saying that we're into these things and trying to you know, minimize the injury risk if possible, some some action which i'm really pleased about so i know this is going to be a horrendously broad question but i think it leads us into nicely into the kind of population and women's specific footwear but in terms of injury risk how much of an impact can footwear have on that injury risk yeah i mean that's the that's the million dollar question and i guess um it could go from any number of things to absolutely nothing. You know, we all know that you can have these incredibly robust players that um, could literally strap anything to their feet and probably never have any issues with their feet, and, and that exists. I think you have to be mindful of of that. And then on the other um, end of end of the spectrum, we can have people that are very um, uh, prone or, or a little bit more sensitive to changes in in footwear and surfaces and things like that. So um, common issues though that you see as a, as a podiatrist, and I have a very skewed sample, you know, only people that have trouble tend to, tend to come in, um, would be, you know, fitting problems, blisters, um, uh, really simple issues, your toenails go on black, um, heel pain, issues with comfort. Now, I guess the issue there is that if you have, this, there's some pretty good evidence in, in uh, professional rugby league and some other sports that if you're comfortable you perform better and you also are a little less likely to, to, to be injured. So it is important to, to get some of those um, fitting parameters and characteristics right. Um, but in terms of what injuries can you get, if we get a little bit more specific, um, there, uh, I mean, this is my gut and my clinical history rather than, you know, cold hard evidence, but we certainly have people that are sensitive to the, the bending stiffness of a shoe. So it's very, very flexible, like a pair of old slippers that you can roll up. Then we, we have people that can have issues with the with the, the plantar fascia or, um, or or metatarsals or different areas. Um, if it's on the other side, if it's a bit stiff for certain people, they seem to transfer up to Achilles calf issues. Or it's very general statements, but you know what I mean. Um, and, and obvious fitting issues. The the main one being you know putting your foot into an extremely small space. So there's a certain amount of area, and you. you Players are really keen to feel the ball and wear them very small, um, and and then we have increased pressure. You know, so um, issues like uh, neuropathy or the way that nerves run run through your metatarsals to your toes can get a little bit cramped. Things like that. Yeah, I remember you just taking me back. I don't know when it would be to mid two thousands. Nike Vapors, like super super light. I was a centre back, so I should not have been wearing Nike Vapors <laughs> at all. Um, but the studs were super long, they were super light, and they were the best boots. But the heel was so thin and used to nip like a god knows what, and yeah, wrote me off. So I can, uh, 
at that point I was and before that I'd just chosen boots and I'd been no problem and I think it was after that I was like okay there's I need to be careful of what I wear because it, it caused me all sorts of issues my stubbornness to try to wear these particular boots and I'm guessing like if professional players and athletes they do get quite hung up on a particular brand or a particular type or a particular look and sometimes we'll go to the end of the earth to make that work even though it doesn't particularly fit for their situation yeah i think it's really important to um have a uh, to understand why they like that boot and to have a conversation about that what they need like if they are just super keen on looking good and the color is right and that is really important to their game it's very hard to have a conversation to 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 alter that or why they should unless it's a different scenario you know if it's someone coming back from their um second fifth metatarsal fracture and it's career threatening and and then that's a different conversation but i think if it's you know i'm brought into a a football academy an elite football academy to kind of give some some advice um you got a heap of heap of kids coming through that pretty much think they're bulletproof and might well be um it's very difficult to to you should try and understand the motives for some of those reasons so if it's very important to a player to, to to look good and to feel good then you have to try and work out um how to work with that you know so finding if finding a way to work around that and that if you're lucky enough to be right at the pointy end of the game and it's for the it's for very few now that um that athlete services at um manufacturers football boot manufacturers will alter boots genuinely alter them for players the They'll select a lot of players where they'll put their family name on them and the flag of their country and, and that sort of thing. Um, but now getting something genuinely built for you and altered in terms of how much depth there is or if you have one foot different size to the other, different width, um, changing the stud configuration, things like that, that's that's for uh, the chosen few now. They're kind of winding down on that. So um, I think having a really good knowledge of, you know, which if someone just swears that they're a Puma guy or they're an Addy guy, whatever it is, and that it has to be light. Having a good knowledge of the subtle differences between the, the, the lines or the silos of boots, is, if there any are ever so slightly wider in the forefoot or a little bit deeper in areas, it's just trying to keep on top of all of that. Yeah. Interesting. So just going back to the population-specific foot, when I can't remember the title of the publication or the, the piece that you were involved with about just making it pink, there was a, there was a nice strappy line that I can't remember that I thought was very clever at the time when I read it but it's it it's interesting I just wanted to know what brands and manufacturers are doing to make this specific for for women rather than just stick a different color on them yeah yeah good question um so that research is led by um associate prof Katrine Ockham Krager um who is uh just a a Danish research machine, really. She is uh, someone who can just get stuff done. Um, I would, if you're interested in that space, I would really give her a follow because I I know for a fact that she has um, uh, some research in that space on um, foot shape and football boots coming quite soon. Unfortunately, I can't talk about it yet. It's it's, uh, under an agreement, but it's coming it's coming in June, and um, she led that piece on on you know how women's feet uh, differ on how, uh, and that can be in quite simple ways, like um, slightly narrower heels would be one thing, maybe slightly wider forefoots or slightly higher profile through the midfoot. Um, there's a there's a I think there's a higher prevalence of of hallux valgus or the or the big toe kind of shooting off in that direction uh, in women players, so their forefoot ends up a little wider. So just knowing some of these things, knowing that in some studies, particularly on artificial turf, it's been shown to be some kind of um, loading differences or plantar pressure differences for certain football movements than than men. So load different parts of their feet. So it's um, the line you're referring to i think is pink it or shrink it it's been a, that's the one a, a, a yeah. industry standard that um boots were probably really firstly designed on male feet and male lasts and a last is a is a kind of shape an artificial thing that made that boots be be constructed around um and the thought is that they were always just shrunk a little bit and then we find a nice color for the boots so um there i see that starting to change as well which is really encouraging um it seems crazy to be chatting about this in 2023, but I think the the success of the Euros last year, the 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 I mean, yesterday there was a world record crowd at um, was it Chelsea 
uh, Arsenal, was it? Uh, uh, Chelsea, Man United, was it the uh, yeah, FA Cup uh, final? Yeah. Um, this is driving the change. I mean, it's 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 a it's something that people are enjoying and consuming, and and it's just it's it's time for that to to improve in terms of um, the availability of football boots. So they are coming. Um, there is a, a startup in Australia that um, really got into this early, and and you have to commend them for for doing that. And and um, but some of the larger manufacturers will will follow suit. Um, probably some of the important things there are obviously the shape can be a little bit different, um, but also some considerations like movement strategies, the, the speed of the game. Um, there is that, you know, you've probably talked about it loads, but that kind of ACL issue that's happening across Australian rules football and, and, and soccer football. Um, so, you know, keeping in mind that this is one risk factor amongst so many risk factors that you know there are in sport, um, it is one, though, that is slightly modifiable. Do you know, like the athletes, the, the, the players have this, slight control over what they put on their feet so if they can get a little bit of information on how the playing surface is you know is it an absolutely terrible artificial pitch that's been let um uh, not maintained very well it's very high friction uh, you know well then should you wear a shoe that also has you know quite long studs or blades that can be quite high friction as well because then you're marrying up two things that lead to a pretty high friction scenario so trying to probably tune in you know do we have another footwear option where there's slightly smaller studs or round um, molded studs and lots of them that release from the surface a little easier and and i think you know that footwear company in australia is is, is trying to do that and and some of the larger manufacturers are now trying to do that as, as well i don't want to put you on the spot and, and throw you under the bus for any particular brands so feel free to veto this question but is there any anything recently in terms of popular design that is not necessary from an injury perspective is not ideal? Um, less and less so, I think. Okay, honest. Cool. I think, yeah, less and less so. I, we used to see lots of, um, lots of really aggressively bladed shoes, so long kind of blades, or Americans would call cleats, um, and they were fabulous for in terms of traction, so performance-wise, you know, there's no doubt that through a curved kind of slalom runs or curved runs and courses that were agility or change direction that there is a performance benefit um uh but they're sort of and and american football was really the place where the majority of this research has been done if there's very aggressive blades or longer kind of uh longer studs or bladed cleats along the periphery of the shoe then they become um a long way away from where you pivot on the shoe so i guess like anything if you have a very long lever arm it becomes a high force. So um, I see a move away from really aggressive kind of lugs, cleats on the out, on the very periphery of shoes. And a lot more now are, are smaller and round, a little bit rounder. They might be a little hexagonal, or um, but there is a lot more thought into that release. Now, I say that, this is all, you know, like uh, I often get on calls and I think people seem to think that I, you know, invented some of this. And I just, you know, the whole standing on, standing on the shoulders of giants. But, you know, when I was doing my PhD, I was reading this incredible work from a guy, Joseph Talk, in, um, in the US, who in 1970 did a rotational traction study and then uh, intervened and made a whole, um, made a whole high school footwear program, a uh, football, American football program change their studs so they went from kind of traditional long screw-in metal studs to what he kind of called soccer studs which is probably like a copa you know mundial or a, or a puma king those black round molded studs that you would think of that are kind of old school um but still really cool um and so we put that across the whole league now there's an absolutely incredible reduction in severe knee injuries i think it was 70 percent or more reduction in severe knee injuries but um but I wasn't there to watch the league. Like they might have all slipped over, and it might have been terrible to watch in terms of a of a spectacle. So it, it's not new work. They, you know, his his colleagues and himself, they started to look at footwear designs. They looked at a swivel shoe, which kind of rotated. So it's certainly not a new idea. It's 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 come and gone. Um, but I think we're just starting to get a bit more, you know, pardon the pun, but a bit more traction to, to do something about it now. Yeah. And you mentioned uh, um, artificial turf. And that's probably, I mean, just from the high end, especially in the UK, the high end, uh, particularly using them kind of surfaces, even probably when the 
the snow comes, they'll probably find an alternative, have an indoor environment or whatever it is. But still, academy players, if it snows outside, they'll be indoor on the 4G. When you get down the ages, they'll be using 4G probably 90% of the time and then lower end using it a lot. So what what difference in terms of the things that you've mentioned um, comes from that switching surface from a turf to a um, an artificial turf? So... It depends, really. It depends if you're lucky enough to be, you know, at a really elite academy who puts time into their surface maintenance, um, or if you are playing down the village centre, like oh, like I would be now, um, and that might be a school surface that was put in for multi-use that has never been maintained. So they, it tends to be these things are sometimes sold as this is a multi-use, you know, multi, maximum kind of hour usage pitch that. Um, that you can use and, and not have to renovate, not have to renovate or do maintenance to. But the real story with that is, you know, artificial grass is made from fibers that, that have to sort of sit up. So eventually, we knock them all down. They have rubber crumb that reinforce that, that gives them some nice, you know, energy return. But we bring half of that home in our shoes, and if you have any kids, they pour them all over the house. They have these little <laughs> green or black rubber crumb. Um, so once that rubber crumb is, is moved around on the surface and moved into different areas and some of those fibers have fallen over and you know people have fallen over and got um, horrible staph infections in their cuts and things, then there's a few things that need to happen. They need to be kind of um, raked back up, if you like, or, or kind of worked back up so the fibers stand up. The rubber crumb needs to be kind of spread around, um, almost uh, leveled again. Uh, often and, and they need cleaned now and then you know so um it depends is the answer so if you're lucky enough to be at the elite end and truly well maintained um we do sort of suggest that you have at least another footwear um option so um they tend to be slightly higher traction on a, on a artificial pitch even even in the dry um even when it's not too hot so there's things that modulate that that alter traction so if it gets very hot that takes the traction up a little bit um if it gets you know very wet then that takes it down which is why in field hockey where they use a lot of water you know there's the so the ball can zip along the surface you probably don't see quite as many acls i think um so there's things that alter that so if you are inside on a really good you know artificial pitch then using firm ground studs that are mainly round you know molded firm ground boot studs that are mainly round or artificial varieties which are short and lots of them now they're not the old school kind of turf shoes people probably think of turf shoes were those kind of horrible vinyl ones with the nubs like lots and lots of of little rubber ones and a a bit of a um, bit of a cushion they have their uses but generally at the elite end I can't get a football player to, to use them at all they're too far away from the ground so these days you're really lucky you can get um, the exact same, you know, elite end boot. If you are a Nike Tempo guy or an Adidas X or whatever it is, you can get that elite level boot with all the same characteristics, just with different studs. So they change the outsole. So you can go from soft ground to, to firm ground. Sometimes there's even a mixed option and then to AG. So it's having an option, which is all well and good at the elite level, a little bit harder if, uh, you know, mum and dad are having to shell out for those and you're growing all the time. Um, so if you're on this on the multi-use school pitch and it's really really quite hard and all the fibers have fallen over, I, I would and you know what it's not the Champions League. You know you're out there for your fitness and to have fun. I would probably err on the side of enough traction not to be slipping, but not crazy amounts. So you wouldn't like to see metal screw-in studs on that surface. They're not going to penetrate well enough. Um, and even some of the really aggressive blades on that surface can be a little bit hard to release. So. Um, especially with some of the youth athletes that are a little bit lighter, it's hard for those studs to... Studs really have to penetrate to the sole plate. That's how the... If you want the pressure to be even with all the studs that come through your boot, you know, you can feel that on your metatarsals and the pads of your feet. So you want that to be quite even. Really, um, the studs have to be able to kind of penetrate that surface to the stud plate. So it, it, it's having a few options, which isn't always easy. So what's the... My, my daughter, oh, Rob, just to say, like, my, imagine being the daughter of a podiatrist that works at all this stuff. And there's, uh, you know, so I, uh, my daughter's four, just turned 14 and, and is a uh, midfielder and she's gone very well. She sees all his face and things. She's never played in anything except AG and maybe occasionally firm ground. I just, uh, she's a 14 year old um, uh, woman who's gone through a huge growth spurt with long levers. And I just, she's not slipped and been having any, any issues. So for me, it's kind of as long as there's a window where you can perform well, but not slip. But if we go kind of 
above that and we start kind of, you know, bumping the traction right up, then it is just one little little factor that probably we don't have to push, I think. Um, in terms of traction, you can only use so much of it. So having more and more of it, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a finite amount of traction or, um, or a kind of window in which you can use. And then after that, it starts to, you can't actually utilize it to get any faster. Yeah, to to do movements more, we're just we're just getting up into a place where, um, where there could be some issues with the studs not penetrating, so we have pressure problems or the boot not releasing. One problem that was always voiced to me was the transition between a grass surface and an artificial surface. Is that something that practitioners need to consider, and how would you? kind of navigate those switches and again that will probably be an academy setting depending on weather availability how would you navigate that from a podiatry point of view oh i wish i wish i knew this is the question <laughs> so part of my work here because of the research is every other night i'll have a chat to someone from a club around the world in in yeah, whether that be you know football or zero rules rugby union and especially rugby union and football where there's surface shifts and even rugby league um and I think there's just some more work need to be done on this. I don't know how people should um, prepare for those shifts. If you know, the same rugby union in the UK, if you know you're going to play Glasgow next week or one of the premiership clubs that are on that surface, but you are on natural grass or even hybrid reinforced grass, which is where they kind of you know reinforce natural grass with a with a few um, artificial fibers. How do you prepare for that you know how much time how much high speed or very high speed running on that surface um should you do and that's i don't know it's a golden question there's been a little there's been too few research on it so in terms of cold hard research there just isn't enough i know uh, alan mccall and his um buddies and i can't remember the lead author sorry but they did do a little bit of work looking at some of the even the physiological markers with surface shifts and didn't find a, a whole lot in a small sample but um Anecdotally, so in the clinic, time and time again, players come in and they complain about it. And so maybe our tools aren't quite good enough to, to pick it up, but it's number one complaint is how, how, you know, this surface shift, how hard a surface can feel, um, how muscle soreness, joint soreness after Achilles, after artificial turf sessions. Um, we have some work coming on that. We've just had a, uh, we have some uh coming on kind of people's perception a player's perceptions of the surfaces they play on um in in rugby union especially and uh there is quite a lot in uh football as well and generally the players don't like it with the caveat though that some grow up with it so if you if you grow up in iceland or scandinavia you know chances are you've played on those sort of surfaces a lot uh, all through your development so it's probably not as big a deal to you as it as it would be for me coming from Australia and and being signed to a club at 35 and finishing off my career, you know, I'm probably going to say, what is this? You know, there's been some really high profile players that have refused to play on it. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure that answers any of the questions, but that's no, no, it does. It, it's it's it. to yeah. kind of answer that I was expecting because I did, I knew it would be a bit of a um, a grey area and probably more work to be done there. But no, that's that's super interesting. But from from a, like a practitioner perspective, understand. Not only their playing surface, but are we going to say then something then, mate? I should just add, Rob, like what can you do? So I just sort of told you, I don't know, but I think probably the same thing. I think footwear options are probably it. Like, um, and that's what we've done in some of the rugby settings I've been in and some of the football settings I've been in is just have, if they can afford to have options. So I had a situation at, at one rugby federation where they changed to some new training and training venue, new pitch, and suddenly uh, some lower limb issues and ACL issues and things. And, and of course, you can never be sure. But once the players start to say, "Well, we're worried about the surface," then we we have a we have a bit of an issue. So, um, getting that trust again, or making sure that that surface has been tested and that we can um, give some advice. So, one thing you can do again is is the footwear. So, if we think, okay, we've tested that surface, the traction is in this level. So, you can use tools to kind of benchmark them and test them and say, well, what, what's the traction ratings? What's the hardness? What's the, on a natural grass pitch, what's the, what's the soil moisture? What are these objective things? But then also go a little bit by intuition. So have some players run over it with two or three different types of outsoles and do a traction course and just see how they feel. They've been doing it long enough. They really know their bodies. They know what's right and what's wrong. Um, I have some arguments and um, one of the godfathers of this kind of research is Dr. John Orchard in Australia has sort of said to me, 
players will just always choose higher attraction because they want to perform and and I just think we need to do a little bit more work there to see if that's definitely the case like if there is starting to be um, a little bit of intuition we can tap into so having some footwear options again that that ag outsole or something to go to and if it feels right or feels better it probably is yeah so that and that plays right into my next question which was understanding the surface that your athletes are going to be playing next whether it's yours or someone else's surface how can practitioners get a better idea to advise their players what the surface is going to be like I don't know if it's the case, still the case, but normally it's a little walk around the pitch and going, ah, it's a mold or it's a stud. Like, is there any, is there anything more objective that we can do to understand that a little bit better and make a bit more informed decision? Yeah, and again, the context matters. So, if you are at a, you know in a national or a professional club, you might get a bit more information. And I would say there would be the. Uh, Really sounds really corny, but the, the the Ted Lasso quote, you know, be curious, not judgmental. So if you can leave your little silo and go and sit with the the ground staff and be dragged along now and then and see what they do and how they do it and listen, they're often measuring so much stuff. Uh, they really and and quite willing to share because unfortunately the communication for um, how performance staff or medical teams quite often um, communicate with with ground staff can be a little bit reactive, which is like players are having a moan, feels too hard for them. Can you do something about it? And that's that's probably not a nice feedback loop. You know, it should be kind of we're trying to set this pitch up in this way that allows you to play the football you want to play. So I know at certain clubs um, they might have set that up to be really quite stiff because there's lots of energy return. They have fast players on the break, so they would try and set it up to, to play the football they want to play. Um, but they would give the players information on that, and then they would, um, you know, they would say this is what the this is what the hardness window is, and give them a bit of reference for that. This is what the weather is, and this is our kind of uh, boot, uh, if you like, stud or outsole recommendation. Of course, it's non-binding. It's not like legally if something happens, it's someone's fault. It's just I as a player would feel a little bit happier if I had that sort of information. And for me, it's so many times I go into clubs or uh, around the world and end up just being this, it's really quite odd, just being this kind of connector guy. Like I think you just go in and like just listen and then kind of go, well, you know, like he's got loads of stuff. Why, why are you guys not talking to each other? And then, and then hopefully leave with them chatting to each other. Um, I know that some of the clubs have put in place that information then on, on the wall, so they'll have it on the in the change rooms for for players. So that's one way, um, and you can use tools to test that. Um, we've made tools here that you know you can load shoes onto and drop onto surfaces and measure the, how how much force it takes for them to release rotational force. Um, but there's a definite trade-off in tools that are really easy to use and give information quickly and tools like mine that is really cumbersome and quite a hassle and you go on and tear up the pitch because you want to get this information and then you've already got the ground staff offside because there's a match coming and it's really important for television. So long and the short of it, it's hard. There's a lot of variables that, that, that change it, um, but tapping into that information that the ground staff have is really, really important and asking the players. The players know. They know what they need and what they like and that's hard as a collective group but trying to kind of let them uh, feel like they're being heard a little bit as well. You know, they've all said it feels a bit firm. Groundsmen are going to poke some more holes in the surface and do a certain maintenance and it should feel a bit softer tomorrow. There's a bit of a loop then um, on, on that. Um, so then the other scenario is if you're not at that elite end, if you're a physio or an SNC coach working in your clinic and you're helping rehab a player in a, in a different league, a, a recreational player, um, that's a little bit more difficult. If you are someone that does on-pitch stuff um, at the end stage of rehab, then I think what you said is really it. You go with intuition. You have some footwear options if you can. You go out and run. There's some things we can put a link to. There's like these little functional traction courses or things you can try. And you literally at the end of that grade on a scale, too much traction, not enough, whatever, just right, you know, and you feel. So if you're lucky enough to have a few options, um, I would, I wish everyone could have two options, you know, at least in those boot silos. So then you at least got something to work with. Um, and uh, especially, you know, at the rehab end of things, I think it's pragmatic to kind of err on the side of a little bit less rotational traction um, rather than more in the early stages. So if you're returning from 
an ankle syndesmosis injury, you know, a rotational type injury, uh, uh, an ACL injury, even a fifth metatarsal sort of loading related, plantar pressure related injury, then working out, you know, if it's quite a firm surface and they feel it's quite firm and the studs aren't penetrating, then kind of um, tuning down to a to a shoe with lots more studs and round ones and more of them kind of thing. So back down to that AG or or, or FG, yeah, um, to thinking about some of those things. Is there any tech that practitioners could potentially take if they're playing away from home to quickly get a number and then that number is, okay, we're air on the side that this is a, this is firm, so you should be wearing a um, a molded stud, or this is getting soft because it's had a rainfall, or what you know, whatever it is. It does that that exists, I'm guessing, and the, is that available? It does. It's still really costly, and some of the tools are kind of wonder how they are. But there are some companies that are starting to really develop in that space, um, and. Uh, I'm not linked to any of these companies, but just off the top of my head, there's one in, in the UK and, and Belgium called Raw Stadia who are trying to build better tools and trying to link them to, you know, to dashboards and things that there's there's data there. Um, and Turf Coach, I think, in Berlin. There's, there's, there's other companies in the UK. There are people trying to progress that a little bit and, and, and also even trying to kind of match some insights from how that surface is to even... Um, some of the other dashboard type or, or AMS stuff like, you know, the GPS stuff and whatever. But at the moment, yes, I mean, you could buy some of those tools. There's there's little handheld things that the ground staff use that some of them came from the horse racing industry. Some of them came from other fields. Um, uh, and but, but ground staff are generally using those to make sure the surface is playable. So probably first thing would be just to go and try and chat to the ground staff. Like they're generally pretty open, I've found. Like they quite like to share they're like mini scientists and i think they're really important yeah failing all of that it it goes back to the intuition it really does uh, failing all of that you know it just goes back to having two footwear options at least and running about in them and yeah i i yeah i mean we had a we had a particular manager at the club that i worked um well i don't mind saying because it's he's it's, talked on the radio about it dean saunders he was obviously liverpool wales international you'd often see him on the tractor cutting the grass because he wasn't he wasn't happy with like you say oh the, the the ground's too soft it's too long it's this it's that he'd get I'll show you and he'd be on the tractor <laughs> cutting the cutting the grass or whatever absolute mayhem but like you say communication with the ground staff and I'm guessing up until relatively recently they were just the guys that cut the grass and they were like in different part they had the lunch separately in a lunch box and everyone else sat in the canteen whereas now these are probably highly educated people who understand the craft and Absolutely. you tap in, tap into those to get the information that can help everyone. Absolutely. And um, I kind of, I'm lucky to sit on some panels now and then, you know, with footwear companies or with, uh, with some of the playing surface things where you do what, like need to be dragged into that conversation and you be part of the medical team, part of the performance team. Um, and in certain countries, that's still a bit of an issue. There's this really doctor-led kind of from the top down, doctor doesn't talk to the guy on the mower kind of nonsense, whereas, you know, in, in Australia or the UK, that doesn't really exist yet, um, I don't think. So um, going back to that question, though, how can you get some information on it if you are, you know, a single practitioner or uh, in your clinic? Um, I think knowing some of the, just the basic differences, like we've put a bit out there in and really pleased to be able to have done it in the Aspatar journal which is just easy reading um, and we've kind of I did it with Dave Rennie actually a physio that was at Leicester City for a long time now at Bristol on you know how have surfaces evolved what are the things you can measure what what's what so there's a little bit in there on you know different grass species so certain um, climates uh, can be very warm and then you have this warm grass which can actually be quite high traction and then you can be in other climates like most of the UK where you have cool season grass or rye grass which can be quite low traction so just knowing some of the bigger differences is probably interesting um you know some of the bigger differences between artificial pitches and, and natural uh between even uh, if you're starting to to work at academies and things some of the hybrid reinforcement in, in the stadium pitches um, and we've got lots of open access stuff if you go to my research gate or something i've hopefully written it in a not too technical way and you get into it yeah nice mate well, the next thing I suppose, the um, the big thing is actually training this area of the body, the, the the foot and the ankle, to actually withstand some of the rotational forces that you spoke a lot about. And we had 
um, Roman Tullion on the podcast, who I know you you know, and I hope I've not butchered his name too much there. I know I have, but not too much. Um, and he spoke for probably an hour and a half on this particular topic. But is there any particular advice that you are echoing of what Roman said or anything new in this area? Because I know, like I said to you right before we started, this is an area that is particularly interesting to the audience because when you look on social media or wherever you, you know people go for information now, it's normally, from what I've seen, it quite rudimentary, and that's what Roman talked about in his in, in his podcast. But yeah, is there anything that you'd recommend or guidance? Yeah, um, I was lucky with Roman. He um, he sent the piece to me that he wrote for you just to help him out a little bit, and I was happy, you know, fortunate to be involved in that. And I really echo a lot of the things he said. So um, rather than reinvent, I think the the podcast you've done with Colin Griffin as well yeah. at um, Santry. Uh, as well as just um, very aligned with how I feel about some of it. Um, and also, um, not to just keep name dropping, but um, there's a guy that was at Aspatar here that uh, also went through QUT with me, Luke Kelly, is uh, a guy at University of Queensland. And Luke and his group, Glenn Lichtwark and uh, Dom Ferris, uh, have have just really pushed this to another level on on the capacity of of intrinsic muscles and um, you know the, their their function. Um, so really point people in that direction. Um, but what I would, if I'm going to say anything about it, I think it's a little bit, you know, it's a little bit possibly the fault of um, <laughs> of uh, of us of of podiatrists and practitioners because. You know, if you make the foot look like a black box and you make it look super, super complex, and yeah, there's loads of muscle attachments and there's loads of bones and there's loads of ligaments, um, and it seems really complex. And if you kind of want it to seem that way because you're going to teach a lot of courses on it and things, then it'll perpetually be that way. Um, and and I think it just doesn't have to be that complex. If you step back a little bit and it all starts with anatomy um, and you have a genuine interest in it, if you look at the origin insertion and go back to your just basic principles, where does that run to? What does it cross on the way? You can kind of figure out what they're for and how you might be able to then provide a stimulus that kind of you know stresses them and, and gets them more... Um, a good base or a good capacity out of them. Um, the caution I would have a little bit, and I don't want to be controversial, but I did see a real trend. There was some really um, popular uh, papers published, and they're a little bit focused on um, maybe just one exercise a little too much. They were they were talking about kind of short foot exercises or doming, so um, shortening your foot or kind of doming or lifting your arch, and that really became, um, for me, uh, a little bit just you know it was it was one exercise for everything you, you, this this kind of doming exercise and i think that can absolutely be part of uh, the way you strengthen your intrinsic muscles and extrinsic muscles of your feet but there's there's just no chance there's enough load with that to to really do you know you have to think about the intended is it is it a, is it a, a football player who will do curved runs and and land from headers and accelerations and decelerations and at times be walking where their heel is in contact first or at other times very high speed running or sprinting where their forefoot is in contact first, which will change the way that the, the muscles and tendons store and release energy. So tr- trying to think about all the things that you need to cover will then kind of give you a bit more of an idea of how to, to strengthen them. Um, and for me, you know, that exercise in uh, by itself is probably not there. I think um, in this space, people really want novel things or new things that can look really cool on Instagram and, and whatever, but there's probably no reason to throw out some of the basic principles that are really, really important. And for us, that often starts with um, a heavy seated, uh, pre- like a soleus type work, like heavy seated soleus work where, you know, where your forefoot is, is well in front with the weight of where you're, where you're pushing on the pads. And so to transfer that force to your soleus, it has to go through your, your you know, your intrinsics and your passive structures of your feet as well. So the, the, that's going to be a pretty good place to start with the base. And then on we go. Um, in other ways, and that can be things that are linear, things that are sideways, curved, all different things um, depending on where you need to get to in the end. And of course, that goes from, um, I don't want to be too prescriptive, you've got so many S&C guys that know so much more than me about this, but um, that of course goes from, if it's coming back from an injury like a fifth metatarsal fracture where you would quite like these structures to load share a little bit, you don't want that fifth metatarsal, let's say, to keep you know going through bending moments. Um, then you would go from that kind of um, base we talked about 
with the seated cilia stuff and, and so forth. Um, and then eventually, obviously, it ends up in store and release type, uh, uh, you know, reactive strengths and pogos and, and things from there in all different planes and directions. So for me, if I'm going to say anything about it, it would be that just uh, it needs to be more than just a, a single exercise. Yeah. So just to kind of link those two points, so that that, that point there with the first half hour of the podcast would based on the surface based on boot selection based on i don't know previous injury maybe previous injuries slightly different because that's a completely other topic but would you advise okay we've got this playing surface that has these characteristics we are a amateur club where people have got one boot selection no matter what the situation would you then recommend people identifying and, and concentrating on the foot and ankle a little bit more in terms of a trend like training intervention or would that just be a rounded snc program anyway yeah no i i I think having that as part of the program you know part of that kind of prevention if you like minimization um prevention is a difficult word isn't it but absolutely i mean robust feet uh that, that you know that's where the forces transfer through uh through the shoes on your on your feet so it's a really important part that probably gets left out for some of the other lifts and the other and the other strategies uh i think but it's you know shows like your own and others it's gathering a bit of momentum i think to start working on these things a little more um the footwear changes are just one little thing there should never be an isolation that you change your footwear like in, in the players that come through here we're so lucky to have they'll often travel with their team physio and doctor and the, the conversation is you know changing their boots or the insoles inside them or any characteristics to their to their boots um is, is one part of it. This other stuff obviously happens as well. Yeah, it's not in isolation. Um, uh, I would say for if it was a, a footwear strategy um, and they're younger or adolescent athletes or younger or kids even, um, obviously they're not, the forces aren't quite the same. They're not so heavy to get those studs to penetrate to the, to the, to the plate to keep the pressure even. Um, we might not need studs that are as long. And there's something a little bit quirky that happens in, in uh, football boot manufacturing, and that is if you make a, a UK size 10, so a, an adult boot, or you make a child size 3, the stud length doesn't go down to scale. Um, it's a manufacturing kind of, I guess it's a money thing to make tooling, to make machines, to change all those things. And um, one of the companies got into some research with us about that, and it was, and we look to try and change that in the future. Um, but yeah, it's to be mindful of that. You know, if you are a 35 kilogram, uh, you know, really agile little guy playing on certain surfaces, artificial school pitches, um, then possibly looking for an AG, you just don't need that stud length. So. If you're unlucky enough to then go and play on a mud bath, then you know you might slip a little bit, and and, and you do need another option. But um, it, so it depends. Yeah. Superb. Well, I've kept you for fifty minutes, and I said that was the kind of sweet spot for the podcast, and we've gone into so much. I think this is like you, I've mentioned and you've mentioned this is a super interesting area, and I think that's added a lot of information to the Roman conversation, to the Colin conversation, to Roman's article and the other articles and the great work that's been done out there. So thank you very much, Athol. It's, it's really appreciated. But if anyone wants to get into more information based on your work, where's the best place for people to um, to find you? Yeah, um, I'm I'm still on Twitter at the moment. Uh, and also they could email me at, um, at Aspitar here. It's athol.thompson at aspitar.com. And I'll try and get back to them as soon as I can. Perfect. Well, I'm going to let you crack on with your evening because you're a couple of hours ahead, so it's probably not far off bedtime for you. But uh, I really appreciate your time and I look forward to catching up soon. Oh, thanks a lot, Rob. Great to talk. Cheers, mate.